I am very pleased to welcome today uh, Christina Peñasco, right? Very good. Uh, she's, a, she's an assistant professor at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she came for visiting here and, and she's working on, on topics that are really related to our seminars, she's working on politics and policy on the, on the energy transition. So the, you have about one hour to talk and then we'll discuss depending on the questions and Thank you very much to be here with us. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very sorry I cannot really deliver the class in French. I promise I'm learning. In paper, I have a big one, but only in paper. Not okay. Okay. okay, okay, well, then we are fine. Yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> Just better. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. I, I am an assistant prof at Cambridge at the Department of Politics and International Studies, but my background is as an economist. So I'm a kind of a weirdo working in public policy for environmental and energy issues, but an economist uh, by training and in a politics department. Uh, I tell you, it's, it's a little bit of a weird thing in academia, uh, and it's not easy to navigate these different, these different things, but one of the things that probably you are seeing in this course is that interdisciplinarity is what brings more ideas, different views, and makes science uh, advance and policy making, of course. Um, yeah. It's blocked, so I just launch again the sharing. Okay. Sorry for that. No, that's fine. Okay, share again. This is this one, right? Yes. Uh, your sharing is poor. Why? Um, Maybe then it's better, first, yes. Then uh, here, then here, then here. Share. And then we maximize there, yeah, perfect. Fine. No? Let's see yeah, if now. Yes. Okay, it was just the, the, um, the type of view in the computer, sorry. Um, okay, sorry for the delay. We are going to talk a little bit about the politics and policy of the energy transition. I will focus more a little bit on the politics than on the policy side, but we will have plenty of time to discuss uh, policy if, if, if we have time uh, later on. What are the goals of the session of today? So I think the idea of the session is for you to understand what we are going to do is to describe a little bit what are the challenges, the security issues related to the energy transition right now, describe the major core themes associated to this energy transition that we are seeing, discuss how particular countries and regions are going to win or lose depending if they get on board of this energy transition or not, and talk a little bit about the geopolitics and how this change in the way in which we produce and consume energy my affect uh, energy development and economic development in different, in different countries. Let's just start with some prompts, okay? We are all aware of what is happening right now in Russia, in Ukraine, and as a, as a result of that, well, it's one of the reasons we have seen increases in prices, in energy prices in the last, in the last month. This is the level of dependency, the share of supply gas uh, from Russia in different countries in Europe. This has generated a lot of increases in prices. We have a huge dependency on Russian gas. So if we just look at the type of European imports on crude oil, coal, and natural gas, Russia is our first import, uh, exported country. So basically, we import a lot of uh, energy from that. And prices are skyrocketing. This is the price of electricity. I don't know if you have talked already about electricity. It's not gas. But basically, it's connected because the price of the energy that fixes the, the price in the way in which the market is designed right now in Europe is the marginal energy, which is gas these days. So basically, since February 2022, more or less, we are seeing all these huge peaks in energy prices, in particular gas and electricity. Is this an opportunity or is not? Is an opportunity for the energy transition? We can see if we are able to send the, the, the citizens the message that this cannot continue. And if we transition to an energy system that will give us a little bit more of security of supply, let's say more than security of supply is independency in the supply of energy, we might protect ourselves, I will not say stop, <laughs> protect ourselves from this sky uh, rocket uh, in prices. 
So that's the focus of today's uh, session. What is going to be or what, is, what are the challenges and the opportunities that we will face with this energy transition? When we talk about energy transition, this is just a, a, a scenario, it's not a prediction per se, uh, but most of the uh, scenarios of different organizations agree in this type of shape. We are expecting to have a peak in fossil fuel demands around 2025, 2030, with a continuous decrease by the end of the century and an increase, exponential increase in renewable energy production and, and generation of electricity from renewable, er from renewable energy. What does it implies? This is a very uncertain scenario anyway. We have a lot of technical change, a lot of uh, technologies to deal with. We need to reduce the costs of many technologies in order to be able to deliver this path. And it's not going to be easy, but it seems to be what is needed. And why I say it seems to be what is needed. Probably you've seen this graph before. Right now, the Paris Agreement has as a goal this two, zero, two, two degrees centigrade scenario by the end of the century. So the goal of the Paris Agreement is at least, well, it's 1.5, but basically to limit the increase in uh, the temperature, the global temperature, average global temperature, by the end of the century to not more than two Celsius degrees, and if possible, 1.5. Right now, with the current policy scenario, we are here. So what's going on? There is a still a gap that we need to cover. The emissions are not on track of carrying the Paris Agreement goals, and we will need two things. More stringent targets, and that these unconditional nationally determined contributions that countries have submitted in order to comply with different targets actually happen, plus well-designed policies or policy mixes in order to foster a faster transition. And what we are seeing is that we need a faster transition. There is a very recent uh, report from colleagues in Oxford that said that if we transition faster, we can, um, I think it is, save 12 trillions of dollars by 2030 if we transition way, uh, way faster each year. But the transition is happening already. This is just a, a graph from our worrying data in which we can see how we have already, or we are already able to produce both in terms of energy globally, but mostly electricity, a lot of our demand by renewable energies. So we have, for example, if we look at electricity only, already almost 37% of our total energy mix, electricity mix in this case, comes from renewable energy sources. This is going to be faster. And from 2010, the increase in the production and consumption from renewable energies, above all wind and solar, has increased enormously, while we've seen a reduction in coal, a reduction in nuclear, and the nuclear case is interesting because while these technologies have reduced costs enormously, nuclear power is the only one that keeps having the same cost a long time, so it's not reducing cost. But what we are seeing is like they are taking, they are taking the lead, and we need them to take, to take the lead. But what are the implications of that? The implications of a transformation in the energy system basically are three. First, a system that will rely more in this particular renewable energy. So mostly wind and solar that have a problem of intermittencies. So they are dependent on weather and we cannot, unless we invest in batteries and all that, storage them. It's a system that will rely will way more in energy efficiency. So we will learn to consume less energy, or we are able to generate the same output with less input of energy, and we are seeing that already. So for example, during the 20th century, the uh, amount of energy demand, it was more or less increased energy demand annually, it was 3%, literally aligned with the amount of GDP growth uh, on average globally. And during the 21st century, we are already seeing an increase annually in the energy demand of 1% in comparison to increases that are still continuously being 
on average, uh, three three percent. And the third challenge is uh, electrification. We are moving towards. We've seen the other graph. So in energy, we are still having huge amount of oil, mostly associated to the transport sector. We will see a change in the way in which we move in mobility, and we are expecting electrification of heating, not only use renewable energy for generating electricity, but also heating. This brings a lot of challenges in the, in the table. I will basically summarize them in five core themes. So the first one related to this transition, and it's mostly related as well to this dichotomy, north, south, fossil fuel economies, renewable energy economies, so keep that, keep that in mind. There are five different topics that might generate issues, let's say, or challenges in the energy transition. The first one is, is this transition, so moving from fossil fuel based economies to renewable energy based economies, will generate more or less conflict between countries? We are seeing already a lot of problems we mentioned at the beginning associated to the level of imports, exports that we have between countries. There we will see how many countries basically accumulate most of the oil reserves and all that. So more or less. And in this case, there is a lot of variability in, in literature. The authors that are studying these issues are not really um, in agreement about this. There is two basic um, extremes. So there's one extreme that says it will be more conflict because there will be related to the intermittency of the uh, renewable energy. This will generate cuts. We will uh, still need a lot of interconnections between countries if we want to electrify economies. This will not reduce the level of conflict we are already seeing because the type of relationship will be the same. It is possible, and this connects directly with critical materials, that we are relying or we are changing the actual supply chain of materials, but we will be dependent anyway of certain countries that have the production of these critical materials that are necessary to generate the, techno the, the technology, to produce the technology that we use, the turbines, the solar panels. And there can be problems associated with cyber security in this countries or in these um, critical infrastructures more related to digitalization. So when we talk about an electrification of the system, everything is digital. So it will be easier to generate these cyber attacks. At the same time, we expect increases in population. So we can expect if we have intermittency, we have an increase in population. What is going to happen? More conflict. People will continue demanding and maybe they will not be able to access the level of energy that they need at the moment when they need it. This can generate or change the um, idea of international conflict between countries to more internal conflict within countries and regions if some people can access energy or electricity in a better way than others at a particular time. More peace. Well, one of the characteristics of renewable energy, and we will talk about it as well, is that it's everywhere. We don't really need, there is not a particular country that owns all the reserves. It's related to the critical materials, apart from the critical materials, that's true, but every country has some more, more or less level of sun, more or less level of wind, more or less level of water. We can reduce the dependencies that we have from oil and from gas imports if we create this system of um, this system, if we basically attract or join the decarbonization processes. But this will bring a lot of winners and losers. And you can already guess, I'm fairly sure, that those losers will be the ones that are net exporters of fossil fuels. And there will be winners that are these net importers and if they are able with the institutional framework, so we will need, we will take for granted that we need an institutional framework that help the decarbonization and that we have the policies that help these technologies to, to get the market. 
these countries will win if they can transform their economies into cleaner economies and less dependent on, on fossil fuels. It can have a lot of impact on this, it can have a lot of impact in relations between the states and this of course again just connects with what I just said, there is, I don't know if you're aware of this project, there was this big project for example in um, the MENA countries, the Desert Tech, to connect or to transform the gas pipelines into electricity grids, blah blah blah, and it generates exactly the same kind of conflicts from country to country because they couldn't agree and we are seeing that as well now between the connections with France and Spain and how much and increasing the interconnections we want, when I say we, Spanish government wants with the rest of the continent and the French government doesn't really want that. So it's possible that relations between states changes as well with these decarbonization issues, critical materials and cyber security. These are the, the five um, main topics to talk, to talk about. We can break down even more, we can basically I don't know if the last row can actually see. Uh, we can actually disentangle a little bit more all these issues, but by the end of the day, all come to the same, to the same thing. Resource scarcity, of course, if we are looking at fossil fuels, we know we are depleting fossil fuels, so it's very significant. It's not significant for renewable energy, except, as we mentioned, in the case of critical materials, important soil location, it's very important for fossil fuels, oil reserves are just in the hands of very small particular set of countries, more moderate for renewable energy, except of these critical materials, control over resources, the same way, geopolitical power, more asymmetric in less hands, more symmetric in renewable energy, although we will see that that is fallacy somehow. International competition, high, low, international interdependence, the same high, low, so it seems that we are going to, to win. In general, if we move from this to that, we will win. <laughs> Key market aspects, there, there are challenges associated to this, so what we are doing or what we will do with this decarbonization of the system is to move problems associated to demand and supply, export and imports, to problems associated way more focus on storage issues, intermittency issues and management and that's why we mentioned this thing about the server security issues because these infrastructures will be way more important in a decarbonized system in which electricity plays a much bigger role than in a system in which we rely on fossil fuels. Why the energy transition will transform geopolitics? Ideas? We have mentioned already some things. Okay. So I think that because of who are the producers of, for example, fossil fuels, you know, you have OPEC, mm -hmm. and right now they have a very big interest in being, continuing to have the power that comes from producing oil, for example, or gas. If the transition happens, these powers will be lost. So it will like reshape who is the one who has the power, the power. of producing <coughs> energy, basically. That's one thing. Yeah, I was also thinking about the uh, export of <coughs> fossil fuels right now, but then maybe um, the like renewable resources, and for example for Europe, maybe Europe will be um, necessitated to um, build large solar factories somewhere outside of the territory. And also in terms of like exported hydrogen or all of these like new technologies. So it's like diminishing of these exports from fossil fuels, but also uh, the replacement by the uh, solutions. That is one of the issues. Mostly the idea of why this will generate uh, challenges, let's say, is that it's the, it's the simple nature of the, um, of the fuel. Electricity renewable energies are very different from fossil fuels. Ones are flows, the other ones are stocks, some geographic dispersion in renewable energy sources versus a geographic centralization of fossil fuels that we just, we just mentioned. What I mentioned, no floor nature of renewable energy versus a stock nature of fossil fuel. When you have used the fossil fuel, you cannot reuse it, while wind is running, 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 and it generates different problems when it's 
blowing a lot because the turbines need to stop. There are some level of wind that they cannot take. It can have some democratizing effects in renewable, renewable energy that fossil fuel doesn't have. So one of the things that it's um, good news uh, from what the literature said, or in particular from my point of view of renewable energy, is the role of new actors in the system. So we are used to big companies, utilities, to run the business, but in a system in which renewable energy is key and is the core of our supply, citizens have a lot to say, small sectors have a lot to say, associations have a lot to say, small communities, local communities, because we can have off-grid systems. And these off-grid systems democratize the use of energy and at the same time give certain power to certain communities, and I will focus on developing countries mostly and, and, and middle and low income countries, where in many cases they are dealing with corrupt governments, uh, governments that are not stable, if they can manage their own energy, their own small decentralized solar power plants, they will be able to work, they will be able to cook, they will be able to do everything without depending on a national infrastructure that most of the time either it doesn't work or there are issues associated to the stabilizations of the, of the systems. And nearly zero marginal cost. We are seeing huge decreases in the cost of solar power, wind power, which now actually is cheaper than fossil fuels. And we generate electricity way more cheaper than we used to uh, in the past because of, because of the huge investment that has been done. But right now, uh, every single uh, increase in the, it's, I think it is a double increase in the solar PV uh, deployment generates cost reductions of 20% or something like that, so it's, it's huge. Oil reserves, we were thinking about which countries have the power right now. Let's focus on, on this. We have Venezuela, Arabia Saudi, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirates over here, Libya, Canada, which is probably the most stable one, Russia. We are dealing with all these countries that right now are not the most stable ones, let's say. I mean, from or since February 2022, Many of the things that I will be saying, and you will be seeing graphs in which Russia appears as one of those countries in which, well, my win, my lose, not, not clear. The current situation, of course, has changed a little bit, these dynamics, but we don't have evidence yet about the direction of, of it. But what is clear is that it seems the power is in, center area, in, cent in, in certain areas, and many of them not super stable, okay? Very particular countries have oil reserves. I will focus here on oil. Well, if we move to a map, solar energy, well, everybody has solar resources, more or less, not Russia. Um, but I mean, there is, there is some research as well that says that they are not very much into going into climate goals, because if we actually go to a scenario of an increase in temperature, they will be able to have more availability of land to produce that it was not useful or usable before because of the, the, the temperature. So it's kind of a particular situation. But we have areas all around which particular or which high amount of resources. And if we move to wind, it's exactly the same. So if we actually put everything together, the scenario is pretty positive in terms of let's decarbonize, let's move from oil, from gas, to a scenario in which we produce most of our energy, and I'm focusing here on solar and wind, but of course we can be talking about uh, hydro, biofuels, geothermal, there are countries, for example, there is a huge um, amount of geothermal energy in, in Kenya, for example. So there is a lot of um, investment going on on, this, on these issues. Winners and losers related mostly to the rents that they receive from their exports of fossil fuels. 
So we see Libya, it was one of the countries with highest reserves, as you've seen before in oil. 53 more or less percent of the GDP of the country comes from fossil fuel rents. And we are talking about a country that doesn't have the highest GDP, like for example countries as the Emirates. So it will be one of those in which we'll have more difficulties to engage or to win with the energy transition. We can go from the most, uh, the one that received the highest rents from fossil fuel exports, Libya, Kuwait, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Chile, Ecuador, and we can imagine that these ones will be the ones that will lose the most. There are several studies looking at which ones and why they will win or, or, or lose. In the literature, so that was uh, Irina, what do we see? There is not yet a particular methodology that has been used in order to study this. So most of the um, indexes, let's say, or most of the literature that have tried to study which are the winners, which will be the losers, apart from all the uncertainty, of course, that we've talked about of the, of the change in itself, has focused more in qualitative, uh, qualitative types of, of research, analyzing particular cases. Okay? So this was one of the uh, readings that I actually uh, gave you in the, in the syllabus and summarizes three existing particular, um, particular indexes. The first one only look at uh, losers, so they will lose but they will be more or less exposed and it looks mostly on this idea of the energy rents. Algeria, Russia, Libya, Egypt, Kazakhstan and Saudi Arabia Saudi Arabia is one of the less exposed, mostly because of the level of um, uh, GDP per capita. Second index, it looks not only about, um, at losers, but it looks also at winners. And it looks at winners, in particular China, for example, uh, United States, that since 2017, with the peak of uh, shale gas, it's more or less completely independent in terms of energy and they are exporting a lot of the gas that they are generating. Uh, India, which has a lot of potential for solar and they are doing a great job uh, in terms of electric vehicles, for example, as winners. Again, here, for example, we see that there can be people that win, people that lose. Again, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, so the countries that we've seen, basically. Same in the last one. This one is the one that is more quantitative and it's connected to the next slide, which is the actual index that Overland uh, and colleagues created. So they designed five different index depending on the variables that they took into consideration. So we have fossil fuel reserves and renewable energy capacity, fossil fuel reserves and renewable energy capacity, but weighted by uh, governance indicators and conflict indicators fossil fuel reserve, renewable energy uh, sources, and fossil fuel dependency, and so on. So basically it's exactly the same, weighted and the sum of all of the indicators. For me, for example, in this case in particular, if we look at the paper critically, the one that makes more sense would be this one, because fossil fuel dependency and fossil fuel reserves will be, in most cases, already correlated negatively correlated. If you have more reserves where you are supposed to produce and you will be less fossil fuel dependent and you have your own resources. So for me I think these ones that, continue, uh, that includes fossil fuel dependency and fossil fuel resources are a little bit double counting something there. So look at this in particular. There are a lot of changes in some of them but if we look at the second one we, we come with the same conclusions. We have countries like Norway that will be able to adapt, New Zealand, Sweden, people or people, countries in the middle that they are still dependent on coal and on uh, oil exports and gas exports but because of the capabilities they have in terms of innovation will be able to adapt so countries like Japan or the Netherlands 
Some other tiers as well in the middle, we are talking about the US, China, what we were saying, and the losers. The loser seems to be kind of a continuum. There is not a lot of uh, difference. Why? More or less resilience related to the GDP per capita, what we already mentioned, and more or less exposure related to the rents. So if we took or look at the GDP per capita, of course, those countries that have better economic development, let's say, will be able either to invest more, to innovate, to buy technology, and it will be less exposure even if they are high producers of um, fossil fuels, like Kuwait, for example. But if we go to countries like they are poorer, and, but the, at the same time, they don't have an alternative because most of the rents come from fossil fuels. We are talking again about countries with huge problems. Libya, Congo, Iraq, Timor, Angola, South Sudan, that will have more difficulties in adapt if, and here is where policy and the policy context and official development aid and the breakthrough agenda and all this comes into place. So all these countries, if we need everybody to transition, need that the rest of the world invest in order to reduce the cost and then they can actually adopt the technologies at a later, at a later stage. Otherwise, it will be very complicated. But we know that official well, the, the rich countries, the, develop, the developed countries, have promised $100 uh, million dollars per billion dollars per year since 2010 until 2020. They didn't comply with that. And now they are increasing it, but still they are lower and below the levels that they promise in order to promote climate mitigation but also adaptation. And that is one of the big topics for the next COP27, adaptation and loss and damages. Because most of these countries that will lose at the same time are the ones that will be more exposed to climate change issues. So we need also to compensate for this loss and, and damages because they weren't the ones creating the problems. The impact of energy transition and innovation. Remember that I mentioned this top, this, these countries like Japan or the Netherlands? Why they are not big losers? Why they are kind of in the middle? Well, they are kind of in the middle because even if they are import dependent, they have already a level of capacity and capabilities in terms of innovation and patents that other countries don't have. So if they have already the framework and all the patents, I mean, we are talking, for example, Germany, I don't know, it's not in the, in the graph. Germany has 31,000 patents for energy, for renewable energy. If they already have the context in order to join the, the, the system, the new system, the decarbonization of the economies, they might be in a good position to replace faster this fossil fuel dependency with something, with something else. Again. Russia, right here, Saudi Arabia, right here, because there is not a lot of innovation in terms of energy patents in these in this particular countries. See, China as well is an outlier. It has it's the country with the biggest number of patents right now in renewable, in renewable energy. So they will have, or they will be in a way better position to survive and to be winning with, with this with this transition. What are the issues or, or, or why these countries will win? So what we have here is the share of uh, primary energy from renewable energy sources in 2021. Again, uh, data from the, our world in, in data that comes from BP. So all this comes from, from BP. There is a lot of countries already with a share of primary energy that is big enough. So we have North America, of course, we have Europe, we have China, and all this. So all the countries that have the capabilities already to generate this amount of energy with renewables will be in a better position to win 
from the, from the transition. There are three particular things to take into consideration to win from the transition. One, the share already. Second, the policy framework. Third, if they are, well, the, the geopolitics, I would want to say, the, the conflicts and all that. And third, the technical capabilities that they have, that they have already. When we talk about technical capabilities that they have already, it's because these countries, I mentioned Germany before, when they had the energy vendor, they have been investing during the last 20, 30 years in these particular technologies. And these investments, most of the time, has been on top of the carbon price that is not the one actually reducing cost. It has been feeding tariffs, that is, uh, it's an instrument that provides a subsidy on top of the price of the market to energy producer for a long period of time. It has been government procurement. All these countries that you see with higher shares of renewable energy, it's because of that. But what we need first, and you can see that, it's like there's no data. There's no way to know what is happening beyond the global north. And second, they need to translate this level of development here into uh, the, global, the global south as well. I was mentioning in particular the case of China. And this is why I was mentioning the case of China. So the rise of renewable energy leaders. They have right now a lot of power and they will have more power because they are basically manufacturing all the materials that we need in order to build solar panels, in order to be wind turbines and all that. So they have the technology and they are the one exporting that. So the, the issues here is like, are we going to move, as your colleague mentioned before, from a level of dependency in five, six, the OPEP countries to a level of dependency, uh, dependency from China. This has huge, huge implications for uh, supply chains, of course, because if the supply chain of materials from China to the rest of the world collapses or there is a um, sabotage, uh, like the pipeline, whatever, what is going to happen? We don't really, we don't really know. So that is, that is one of the things to take into consideration. So China is well positioned already in this case, for example. And China is very well positioned because they have a lot of critical materials. That is the second thing to take into consideration when we think, look uh, about the countries that will be the leaders in this, let's say, renewable energy race. The countries that have more materials, mineral rich countries, will have an opportunity to be part of this global uh, movement and move from economies that are based on fossil fuels to economies that are based in renewable energy. The main problem with this, again, is well, these are the particular materials that are necessary for uh, generating solar, generating wind, and electric vehicles. The ones that are more um, critical, critical, is the rare earths. So because some of them are pretty much available all around, the main problem is if they are available to an extent that the production is actually uh, economically um, viable. But rare earths generates a lot of problems because it's only produced in very particular, and there are only reserves in very particular countries and many of them countries with a lot of conflicts, like Congo. So we have to take that into consideration. This is what this map basically uh, tells. Minerals and metals for the energy transition. So what we see, the, the color is just different materials, uh, different minerals. In total, they, they, I think, map 12 different, different minerals. The color of the countries is the level of conflict. And as you can see, except Australia, which is in a very, very good position in order to be a winner and actually export electricity and all that, or Chile here, and the main problem with them is like they are a little bit remote areas and they will have to invest more in connections and all this. But apart from 
this area and this area, the rest of focus or the rest of uh, accumulation, concentration of critical materials are in countries or in areas that are not particularly stable from a political point of view. And we obviate now, of course, all this because this would be now a red, like flashing, flashing red. Okay. Are we moving then our dependency from fossil fuels to something else? We don't really know and it will be a matter of time that we know, but it's good that we have into consideration already this in order to avoid and try to diversify what we need in order to make the transition faster, more efficient and cheaper, uh, cheaper as well. Uh, Cyber security. This is just a list of not exhaustive of documented attacks and incidents affecting energy infrastructure. Not only, this includes not only um, digital infrastructure, but also um, pipelines, like the one we've seen with uh, the Nord Stream uh, these days in the, in, the Baltic, in the Baltic Sea. And it comes to this idea, remember the, the table with the particular differences between fossil fuels, energy demand, and so on. Uh, sorry, fossil fuels, renewable energy. It comes to the idea that we will move from a market, from a system in which we will be thinking of exports, imports, trade, trade, trade relations, and so on, to a system in which our focus will be interconnections and digital interconnections, and digitalization, intermittencies, and all that, that are easier to attack from a cyber perspective, from a virtual, from a virtual perspective. All this, I mean, I don't know if you've seen or have been ever in, in one of these big centers of distribution and, and connection with all the map of mm, connections between different uh, countries and all that. This infrastructures maybe are equally exposed but they will be more and we know the impact that this can have if that happens can be even bigger than a disruption with fossil fuels because of the intermittency character of the particular of the particular energy uh, that we are that we are talking talking about um, this is the continuum of the table one of the things related to uh, an increase in the level of renewable energy as well in, in the system is changes that we will see in trade patterns. We talk about that reduction in the imports and exports. So basically, in a world in which renewable energy is dominant in the system, we will be talking about trade in renewable energy related goods and technologies and that is why we saw this huge bar with China. They are producing now everything and the rest of the world buys things from them. The main uh, issue is again associated to the critical materials and the red thirds. This is supposed or this is expected to be a short term kind of issue or dependency because we expect with time, given that the decarbonization of the economies is something that will happen sooner or later, um, we expect that this reduction, we will reduce the dependency from China on this front and we will try to find, of course now, more reserves of these metals uh, in, other, in other places as well. But there will be trade issues related to that above all technologies like solar, PV, um, wind, uh, smart meters, EV batteries, all this trade will be the ones that will increase now in comparison to uh, particular exchanges of oil or gas. Electricity trade will increase because of additional interconnections, grids that needs to be more stable, more flexible in order to accommodate all this intermittency and it will need to be connected to batteries and all that. 
So basically, electricity trade will increase, or we expect it will increase in the new panorama of trade worldwide, while we see a decrease, of course, in oil and, and gas exports, and trade in renewable energy fuels. And this connects as well with something that your colleague mentioned before, the hydrogen. So we are not only talking about a decarbonization of the economy in terms of we are going to electrify everything. At the beginning, I mentioned electrification as one of the core issues, and, and it's one of the key things in the transformation of our economies from fossil fuel uh, based economies to renewable energy based economies. But there are processes, industrial processes, that cannot be easily electrified because electrification doesn't generate the high amount of the, the high temperatures needed in order to process, for example, metals. So there are, for example, a steel industry that will need other type of fuels. And it's when we talk about trade in renewable energy fuels. Those countries that have, for example, high reserves or high amounts of renewable energy production, if they invest in particular in generating hydrogen from electrolysis with renewable energy, what we call green hydrogen, will have as well more power and will be able to generate exports not only from electricity produced with renewable energy, but also from fossil fuel, or fossil, no, sorry, non-fossil fuels, um, renewable energy fuels in the, in the future. It's a still uh, kind of, um, new territory because hydrogen, green hydrogen is still very, very expensive and it will need a lot of, uh, a lot of investments, again, from developed countries. So we expect that developed countries invest a lot in blue generating um, uh, blue hydrogen and in particular in, in green, green hydrogen. How? And this comes to the policy side. What we've seen in the past is feeding tariffs, government procurement, subsidies, and all that has been the policies that manage to reduce costs in certain technologies. Something that I haven't mentioned here is the role as well of negative emission technologies, but it goes as well in the same, in the same box. I mean, we will need to reduce the cost of, the of those technologies through investments in the developed world, mostly, because all these scenarios, the, the first image that I show with the scenario about the two degrees and 1.5 degree and all that, all these scenarios of the international, um, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change actually say that we need these negative emission technologies, and right now they are still very, very expensive in order to be able to produce or to be used and generate any particular um, benefit. Uh, challenges for countries in the global south. Technology and value chains. We mentioned that China, for example, in this will have a very powerful um, position. Financial risks and path dependencies. That is where a lot of the institutional context helps. So in those countries in which there is not uh, stable governments, uh, the governance indicators tell us don't invest there, uh, where foreign direct investment don't go because it's too risky, the private sector don't go, we will need the use of institutions like the multilateral development banks uh, and, and uh, green development banks that will actually invest or are the ones connecting official development aid from countries that want to invest in the global north from or from countries in the global north to countries in the global south. And these institutions are the ones that allow these investments in green technologies to the risk, set the idea that these investments are worthy, are safe, reduce risks, reduce the prem that investors will require given the level of um, risk of the countries per se, and allows to eliminate or reduce at least the, this path dependency of countries having 
a huge amount of problems associated to reaching uh, or getting credit from, uh, from the global north. And trade, because they will have to adapt, as we mentioned already, to the, to the particularities of the, of the new situation uh, with a reduction in, in oil and, and gas. I mentioned I was going to talk about the opportunities for the global, for the global south, and in particular, in terms of democratization, we already mentioned something like this. Population served by off-grid renewable energy solutions. These off-grid systems are already available, are at least in the developed world. There are a lot of uh, projects, small projects, from the uh, bodies of the UN, UNDP, for example, or UNEP, with projects in particular countries in the global south that are increasing the amount or the amount of systems, of grid systems, installed in those countries, above all in, in sub-Saharan Africa and in the um, Middle East. So there are a lot of projects associated to digitalization of grid systems, mostly solar, as you can see, that allows to empower communities individually because they can even work in the maintenance of the systems and they generate kind of a self-sustained community that produce the energy that they can use, they are not dependent on the governments that most of the times are corrupt and they can rely on this for everything, for education, for cooking, for water, for all the resources that are needed in our, in our daily life. So it's a particular type of technologies as well that will generate, um, when I say technologies, of free technologies, that will generate a lot of changes in the way we perceive or we are used to the business model in terms of the energy system from utilities, distributors uh, and, and consumer to a consumer that will become their own producer. This will change a lot. And the importance in this case of um, fossil fuel lobbies will be huge in terms of the politics. And just to give you an anecdote, in COP26, the fossil fuel lobby was the biggest group represented in COP, which is kind of, kind of fun. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think one hour. Uh, takeaways. The rapid increase in the generation of energy with renewable energy sources is likely to reshape the global power of certain states. We will see that countries will lose power associated to export uh, reductions. Some countries will gain power associated to, for example, access to these critical materials and already systems that allow them to innovate, produce and be able to faster uh, join the decarbonization systems. Fossil fuel exporters may decline the global in, uh, influence if they cannot transform their economies. So there are countries like Norway that will be able to transform their economy. They are big exporters of, of oil, but at the same time, and gas, but at the same time, they are in a position in which they can actually uh, join the decarbonization efforts. We will likely see a rise in the power exerted by renewable energy producers. Uh, and in this case, as I mentioned, critical materials. China will have a very particular role in this case. The centralized system may introduce the new relationship, as we just mentioned, between citizens, new actors, the market, communities, local communities, and some things that we don't talk a lot about uh, when we talk about the decarbonization of the economies, the actual role of local, regional, and national governments. We talk a lot, most of the time, about these international relations but the role of local governments in this has a lot to say because usually they know better what their communities need. And when we talk about energy efficiency, they are the ones that can actually implement a lot of changes in how we um, transform our, our economies. And lastly, all this is subject to a policy framework that facilitates the transition. Policy framework that includes regulations, targets, uh, renewable energy standards, um, vehicle fuel economy standards, building codes, 
that includes economic instruments and financial instruments, of course a carbon price, but on top of a carbon price we will need a lot of support in the form of loans, grants, subsidies, around investments of course, in order to facilitate the transition and also soft instruments to educate the people. One of the, one of the issues with the cyber attacks as well, uh, and it's funny, it's the, the um, lack of confidence, the lack of trust of people in the smart meters, for example. So in the UK that was a huge problem because um, people didn't trust the smart meter. I mean, still, the amount of people that have a smart meter in the UK is very, very low because they think the smart meter is, is spying them. Um, so they are not engage with the, with the system and if we don't engage people it doesn't matter what we do, we have seen that as well here in France, we will not be able to transform the economy at the speed we need because that's the problem. There is no more time for another 30 years of well we will see, no. Either we start doing things or we are going to be a little bit in a complicated situation. So these are the takeaways. Um, I would like to know your first impressions. I had put some questions to reflect for discussion if that uh, is useful, but of course, uh, feel free to um, ask whatever you want and, and discuss any particular um, topic and, and all this. And thank you.